and uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. It was. I don't know how your Spanish is, but I was. My nice Spanish is terrible, Juan. <laughs> it's almost non-existent. Uh, I can order a, a, a glass of wine. Oh, that's just, I I only said the the best things that I that I think they are true. Please uh, go ahead. Well. Thank, uh, thanks, Juan, for that introduction, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to present this research in, uh, uh, in the economics department. I only wish that uh, times were different and I could have traveled to Colombia instead to present this in person because you know, I've never visited Colombia, but I like uh, South America very much, so maybe at some other point I'll be able to do that. So my a lot of my research lies at the intersection of urban economics and sports economics. And I think this paper falls squarely in that space. Uh, and as you can see from my title page, this is joint work with a former student of mine, Amir Neto, who's now at Florida Gulf Coast University. Amir's Brazilian, and so he's really the uh, uh, person with all the institutional knowledge. I'm not gonna be able to uh, answer a lot of uh, deep questions about uh, football in Brazil, if you have questions about that, but um, we'd have to get Amir to do that. So I'll just let you know where the, the data come from. Okay, so the idea here is, is to explore uh, what the effects of localization is on the performance of firms. And here our firms are football teams. Uh, so I want to talk first, because in general, about the uh, urbanization economies. You know, it's, a, it's fundamental to urban economics that we have cities because there are benefits to urbanization uh, that would not be present if, say, economic activity or the residence of people was spread uniformly out across space. Uh, urbanization economies is a, is a textbook urban externality. Urbanization economies refer to any sort of external economic benefits that are generated by large, dense populations in cities. Uh, these urbanization economies make firms located in cities more productive and, and provide the basis for why uh, people cluster together, cluster together in cities, businesses uh, and, and households. So uh, the source of urbanization economies is um, Diversification and the scale of the urban economy, just really big cities uh, generate this and with high population densities. So the, the paper um, makes both a theoretical contribution and uh, an empirical contribution in assessing the effects of uh, localization and, and uh, urbanization on firm productivity. Um, and the theoretical contribution is based on a standard model in sports economics. And I know most people aren't going to be familiar with this, uh, but it's called in sports economics, the, the two team model. And uh, we need a different model of outcomes in sports leagues because of the joint production that occurs in sports leagues. I mean, uh, there's, there's football in Colombia and uh, the, 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 uh, football league in Colombia or in, in any country, a domestic league, can't put on a competition unless there are multiple teams that are playing in that competition. And that, because the output is jointly produced and zero sum, uh, the models look a little bit different than standard urban economic, economic models. But there's already urbanization built into the two team model that I'm going to talk about in a few moments. That is, uh, it's the realization that sports teams and leagues in, exist in both large and small cities. And the ones in large cities have advantages because they can just generate more revenue in those markets uh, because of the larger population in those, you know, in those cities. Uh, but density and localization is not explicitly in this model. So that's a contribution. So in contrast to uh, urbanization, economies, there's also a, uh, the idea of localization economies. So localization economies come from, are the economic benefits that are generated by a concentration of firms in specific industries and cities. Um, and, you know, there's examples of uh, localization economies all over the world. 
I mean, Amsterdam has a, has a huge uh, diamond market and there are many, many, many diamond uh, retailers located there. Or uh, you can think about parts of US cities where uh, Italian restaurants or Chinese restaurants, or Chinatown in, uh, in San Francisco or something like that. So you have lots of uh, firms um, spatially concentrated. So the benefits from these localization economies, oh, and by the way, the, uh, uh, the background on this slide, if you haven't noticed it is uh, London. And all of the Premier League and, and uh, championship football teams in London are, are identified on the map because there's actually 12 uh, first and second division football teams that are located in uh, the greater London area. And that's my classic example of localization in football, in football leagues. So the source of these localization benefits come from uh, shared inputs and labor market pooling or matching, right? So there's a, it, where there's many football teams, there's many football players, and there's many football coaches, and there's many uh, football trainers and uh, uh, people that take care of the health of football players. And that allows many teams that exist in these large cities to have a pooled labor market and improves matching between workers and firms. And there's also this idea of there's knowledge spillovers. That, that take place because you have a large number of firms in the same industry clustered, uh, located in a city. Uh, now, again, this is generally neglected in the sports league literature. It's certainly an important part of the urban economics literature, uh, but we also make a contribution here by an, performing an empirical test for the importance of localization economies that I think is, is novel in the urban economics literature. Okay, so there is, there is a small literature that's out there in sports economics about agglomeration. And I just wanna talk about that because that's where we're also extending the literature. So there's this paper in um, a Public Finance Review that shows that uh, professional golfers and NASCAR race car drivers in the US tend to agglomerate. Uh, NASCAR agglomerates in North Carolina, around Charlotte, North Carolina and golfers agglomerate in um, Florida, where they many, many, many of the professional golfers in the United States live in Florida. And, uh, and that's, a, that's one paper that shows uh, some evidence of, of uh, localization in sports. And then there's these two recent papers that came out in regional studi studies that, what we, that are what we are really extending here. It's this Doran and Jordan paper, 2018. They look at football teams in, in England, and they show that uh, proximity to other high-performing English Premier League teams improves team performance, which suggests the, the importance of localization, but just the distance between any two football team stadiums is really not a measure of localization like we would have it in the urban economics literature. So I would say that that paper is suggestive, but not really definitive in, in showing that localization has an an impact. And then there's a 2019 regional studies paper by Jones and Jordan uh, that shows that uh, English Premier League teams in England um, playing in cities with larger populations finished higher in the standings. And again, that's evidence that urbanization is improving the productivity of those firms or teams. And I'll, I'll just use the, the words uh, team and firm interchangeably in this presentation. So that's where we're going and this is what we're building off of. So the paper, the contributions, uh, first we show that localization alters sports league outcomes. That is large market teams are more successful uh, because of a concentration of other teams in these cities controlling for the standard urbanization effects. Uh, we extend this uh, commonly tech used textbook two team model of a sports league to include these localization effects, show how that works. We develop empirical evidence from Brazil and the, the uh, Sao Paulo state competition supporting this idea that localization within uh, football divisions matters. And uh, I think for me, one of the important contributions is, you know, Brazil is a developing country and almost all the evidence we have in urban economics of the importance of localization and urbanization comes from developed economies like the US or European countries or even uh, Asian countries like Japan. 
and this uh, we are now in this paper then developing new evidence that both localization and urbanization affect productivity of firms in a developing economy and i think there's there's renewed interest or um, uh, increasing interest in urban economics and understanding the urban economics of cities in developing countries okay a little bit of institutional background because I think it's a, it's completely correct for anybody to say well why the heck are you looking at at a state football competition in in Sao Paulo state Brazil well I mean certainly um, maybe a, an audience like I'm talking to here in South America understands the size and uh, scope of Brazil but a lot of uh, non South Americans probably don't Sao Paulo State, where we focus on, has roughly the same size as the United Kingdom, and it has roughly the same population of Spain. So I think nobody would blink an eye, uh, bat an eye, if we would apply this to either the United Kingdom or Spain, and we're just saying, well, Sao Paulo State is pretty similar to con European countries that size. And it's also a nice uh, setting because there's a lot of big cities in Sao Paulo State. Uh, three cities with a population of, of more than a million, and then there's Sao Paulo itself, which is huge. Six other cities with a population of half a million or more. So that's that's a really good variation in uh, in in the degree of of urbanization in this setting. Our and our uh, particular focus is is on the annual professional football league in Sao Paulo state, the, and I'm sorry for butchering this, the people that speak Portuguese, Campeonato Paulista. Uh, that's the annual competition that's been held since 1901. So we exploit in our empirical work, uh, an institutional feature of football leagues, which is promotion and relegation across the four divisions in the Campeonato in the CP is gonna create spatial and temporal variation in the concentration of teams and cities. And that's what we exploit in our empirical work. So the CP has four divisions, uh, Serie A1, A2, A3, and the Segunda division, A4, and teams fall also in and out of the, of the A4 division. And that's what's giving us some of the variation, but also just promotion, the usual promotion and relegation system is, is changing uh, the concentration of teams in different divisions and cities. So, a1 divisions A1 through A3 throughout our sample period had 20 teams. Now, not the same 20 teams because of promotion and relegation. Uh, uh, League A4 had between 32 and 48 teams, depending on what the uh, people that run the CP decided to do about that. And another interesting feature that's important for us um, is that the the a1 through A3 division seasons run January to May. And that's important because that's a period when the European leagues are not allowed to add players. And that means that it'll be a pretty homogenous group of players on these uh, CP teams throughout our sample period. And that's important for the estimation of uh, these localization effects. And it's also, uh, an advantage that we have a, a regional league because that means that there's probably a, a regional pool of players that are uh, used and employed in these firms. And, and that also gives us homogeneity in terms of uh, labor inputs in, in the model and the analysis. Of, and then of course, uh, as everybody knows in Brazil and much of South America, football was the only game in town. Um, and I think I've been over these things uh, as well, so I don't have to talk about this slide. All right, so so here's the two-team model and what we how we extend it. So the two-team model, there are as it as the name um, suggests, it's this really boring football league with only two teams that play each other repeatedly. And uh, so here's the 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 subscripts I and J index these two teams. And I'll just point out, if you're not familiar with this model, uh, there's a N, N team version of the model, which uh, all the results that we have here in the two team model generalize to immediately. So it, there's nothing special about this model uh, because of the assumption that there's only two teams. It just makes it a lot easier to solve. So teams are uh, profit maximizers. And the central assumption in the two team model 
is that teams choose a level of success, W. We'll, we'll think about that as, as uh, win percentage, or you could think about it as the number of points that they would score in a, in a football competition or however you want to operationalize team success in a sports league. So <clears throat> the choice variable for teams is, is how successful the teams are. Uh, the teams earn revenues, which depend on how successful they are. And the revenues also depend on uh, this M, which is, which is the market revenue generating potential of the market that team I plays in. So in the standard two team model, there would be this urbanization effect, use of I, which basically says teams in playing in cities with more people in it um, have uh, the ability to generate more revenue, so their revenues will be higher. What we're adding is this A parameter. That's our localization parameter. So A captures all these localization uh, externalities that have to do with how many teams are playing in that particular city, I. Then the cost structure is really simple in these models. Teams face a fixed cost, F sub I, of producing wins. And uh, there is a variable cost that depends on the price of labor, P sub I. And uh, basically this is, you can interpret this price of labor in these models as the average salary played, paid to players on this team, team I. And then uh, they basically, it costs, you know, adding additional players leads to additional wins. So this is the variable cost. And uh, we'll assume that the variable cost of paying players is also a function of these localization economies. And that's because of the shared labor markets, which teams in the, in the large uh, market get to, get to experience, right? And then the, the um, profit function for Team J in the small and uh, not as strongly urbanized or agglomerated um, city is just the same, only we have the J subscript. So you, you choose wins uh, subject to the usual um, uh, profit equals revenue minus cost idea. And uh, basically the idea is this, this, these revenue functions are concave and, and the cost functions are uh, linear and there's, a, there's an equilibrium there, right? We make the usual assumptions about the shape of the, of the revenue function, it's right here. Strictly concave and team success. Uh, U is a standard urbanization effect, and that's so. Uh, the first derivative of that is positive. The more, the larger your population, the larger the uh, the ability of the your market to generate your revenues. Now we can't sign the localization effect a priori, um, and that's that's because uh, right here, this guy we can't sign. That's that's because you put more teams in a city it's possible that that just divides up the market in that city for football um, by more, uh, uh, more and more teams. And in that case, it would be negative, but there's clearly this idea in, in football that if you have more teams in a city, it's more likely that you're gonna develop a rivalry with another team in your city. And I think everybody knows how that works in football, right? Uh, think about, you know, in, uh, in Buenos Aires and uh, the intense uh, rivalry there between the, the uh, River Plot and uh, Blanken on the other uh, team in, in the- Boca. In, right, Boca Juniors, right? Thanks, Juan. Uh, so because of the potential for these rivalries to develop, we, that, I mean, that would mean that the more teams there are in your city, that could actually, increase revenue generating potential if those rivalry games or the general rivalry uh, uh, with another team drives up your revenues. Uh, but we, and by assumption, we're gonna assume that the, the effect of localization on uh, salaries is to make um, salaries lower because of uh, improved labor matching and, and, and uh, the pooled labor market, which is substantially larger in, uh, in these large cities. Then we got fixed costs. Okay, so, I mean, I'll just cut to the chase. We, we, what's the effect of, uh, of localization on the success in, in city I? Well, again, we can't sign it because, primarily because we can't sign, uh, we can't sign this guy. 
Uh, and it's the same in, in WJ. Unfortunately, we can't sign it, but that's an empirical question. It's okay, we can't sign the, uh, the cross price elasticities uh, between goods in the standard consumer choice model either. It, it happens sometimes. But we can unambiguously sign the effect of urbanization on team success. And that's unambiguously positive. So any team, the larger the city is that you play in, this is a standard prediction that's already in there. This is, this is our, uh, our theoretical contribution. Or to put it this way, the, the, the nice thing about the two team model is that, is that it has a graphical solution, which is pretty easy. This is cost and revenue for team J. This is cost and revenue for team I on these vertical axis, axes. And the horizontal axis uh, demonstrates or shows exactly how the zero sum nature of uh, wins in this league works. So we read team success for team I from right to left. So down here, that's no wins, 0% of the wins for team I. And for team J, we read it left to right. So this point down here in the very bottom is team I wins all the matches, team J wins none of the matches. And uh, this is the opposite where team I wins all of the matches and team J wins none of the matches. And then, you know, the 50-50 uh, uh, outcome where the, the teams finish in a tie at the end of the league is here in the middle. This is the, um, these are the marginal revenue curves for the, for each team. So we, we read marginal revenues and the idea is that the marginal revenue of an additional win is diminishing. That's why these things slope down. Equilibrium outcome in the league is, is here where the marginal revenue of, of team I is equal to the marginal revenue of team J is equal to the marginal cost of labor or talent here or salaries. And you can see the standard prediction from, uh, from the uh, two team model Team I is the large market team. Revenue generation uh, is higher for team I. So the marginal revenue curve is up here. So the equilibrium in the league is team I wins most of the matches. Team J wins fewer of the matches and the large market team dominates. Now, what happens in, uh, in this case is remember that the, um, the effect of localization on the price of labor is to drive the price of labor down in the large market. So the, the league gets pushed by the localization to this point right here. So every outcome in the league has to, has to lie on a, uh, on a vertical line because that's the, only, uh, that's the only outcome where the sum of the winning percentages is equal to one. And that has to happen in any sports league. So instead of this unbalanced outcome, the presence of localization makes this league even more unbalanced and drives it to a point where uh, team I chooses to hire even more uh, or has more talented players and is more productive. Team J is worse. So uh, there's the prediction how localization effects are also going to affect outcomes. And it says that, you know, it, it says that, well, if the, if the only effect here is is working through prices, then uh, then the team in the in the more localized city should be more productive. Of course, we we can't make a clean prediction on this because this is holding the effect of uh, of localization on revenues constant. But uh, still, it gives us a prediction that that this can affect outcomes. This localization. Okay. So now the question becomes: Is there any evidence that localization actually does affect uh, team outcomes in uh, in the CP. So to do that, our empirical work is basically the estimation of a, a reduced form model, where the dependent variable is a is a measure of team success. It's we're one of the first people to try to uh, formally test localization and the impact of localization on football team success. So it's not clear to us what the best. Uh, team success variable is. If in standard urban models, this would be easy to determine because you know, people look at wages or output per worker in, in micro data and make these sort of tests. But you know, what's the, what's the measure of football team success? There's many of them that are out there. So we're just going to use a number of different uh, measures of team success, which I'll get to in just another slide. Um, so T index is a, 
a team. D is the division that that team plays in. Again, there's four divisions in the CP. M indexes the municipality that the teams are, are located in and Y indexes the season. So it's some, it's some team success measure. We've got a localization measure. Uh, that's actually wrong. I've got to fix my slide. Um, uh, I will go through what that is. We're not using, we, we took the HHI results out. What, what we have there is, uh, is the, uh, the raw count of the number of teams in each division, in each municipality, in each year. We've got an urbanization measure, which is both the population of the city in season Y and the, the average wage in that city. And then we've got a vector of other time varying uh, and variable control variables that vary across municipalities. And we've got every fixed effect known to man that we've thrown into this model. Uh, a, 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 a team fixed effect, a division fixed effect, a municipality fixed effect, and a season fixed effect in our error team, which a term which we'll assume is uh, heteroscedastic and needs to be clustered corrected. So the urbanization uh, proxies, we use population, we use population density, we use median, median wages. And then those control variables are things like uh, the total municipal employment, the number of, uh, total number of establishments in that municipality, the municipality population. And we also use value added by sector to control for differences in uh, the composition of firms in these different Brazilian cities. And so we estimate this model using seasonal or annual, season specific or annual data from 2007 to 2015. And that's because that's as far back as the, uh, as our urbanization and socio-demographic control variables go. So short-term success, we use two types of team success, a short-term measure, a long-term measure. The short-term measure would be the, would be common uh, outcomes for football teams. Uh, the ratio of wins to losses, the goal differential, and the number of points that are uh, scored. So uh, both the points and, and one loss ratio, they clearly reflect the zero-sum nature of within division competition in each se season, right? Because if you get three points for a win, the team that you're playing got zero points for the loss and so forth. Goal differential, uh, doesn't necessarily reflect that. So that's why we're using different measures of short-term uh, success output. For in terms of long-term success, uh, we estimate some models that just, uh, the, the dependent variable is a dummy variable equal to one if your team was promoted to the next higher division in that season, uh, or a different model for in that where the dependent variable is equal to one if your team was relegated at the end of that season. But then I think a more novel measure of, um, of long-term success, we calculate these ELO scores um, for, for the teams in this league. So ELO uh, scores were uh, initially developed to understand the ranking of chess players in, in world chess competitions, but they've been increasingly common uh, in, in sports. And uh, it creates a ranking of every team based on past success. Uh, so basically, uh, you, the, ELO prob, um, the ELO score for any team just depends on, is just a function of, uh, of previous wins. You've got to give it an initial value uh, to calculate it. Just technically, we, we give the initial value of the last place team in A4 in our first season, 1500, the first place uh, in, in the top division, uh, a, an ELO score of 1779. And uh, we add three to each place higher that, that the teams finish. And we have to let this run for a couple of seasons to calculate um, a, a stable ELO score. And, and so we have several seasons before the first uh, season we analyze to estimate these ELO scores. And then so we can get in, the ELO score for each team and is, is a ranking, but you can also look at the difference in the ELO score between each team and calculate a probability that the team wins that match. And that's used to update the ELO uh, ranking. So for example, uh, this 279 point difference between the first place, uh, the top team in, in division A1 and the last team in, in division A4, uh, gives a win probability of 83% for the, the best team in the whole country against the worst team in the whole country. That seems to make about plausible sense to us. 
right? So, and here's how the updating works. So every, the ELO score is changing throughout the sample period. And we just use the average ELO score for a team across each uh, season. But the updating just depends on um, actual, the actual outcome, uh, which is um, a win or a loss and uh, the expected outcome. And if the actual outcome is different from the expected outcome, then the ELO score gets updated. According to this is RN and then that's the R here that goes into ET. Um, so we update the, it's the average across every match during the season and we update uh, the ELO scores that we're using in the empirical work at the end of each season. So I just want to point out that here's Sao Paulo State. <clears throat> I just want to point out that we have pretty good variation in, uh, in, in these counts of teams across municipalities, across time. So you can see this is the 2007. That's pretty small. That's 2007, uh, 8, 9, and down here, this is the final season, 2018. The real red area here, of course, is Sao Paulo, the city. And there's a lot of uh, uh, top division teams in Sao Paulo City, but there's also pretty good variation. You see teams are coming and going in other areas uh, and the concentration is changing in the top division in other areas of Sao Paulo State. So this is the sort of variation in, um, in, uh, in localization that we are exploiting. And again, our identification strategy here is that this this localization variable reflects the number of teams in, in a city in a division over time. We are arguing that uh, that's plausibly, plausibly exogenous to unobservable factors that are driving team success because, you know, whether you get promoted or relegated, there can be sometimes uh, no difference in points and only a difference in, in goal differential between being relegated and not being relegated in a league. So those teams should be similar and that, that variation should be exogenous, we're claiming. So again, uh, our, our primary concentration measure is just a count of the number of teams in each municipality in each season in, in a division. So we get one of those counts for each, each division D. And we calculate that and we have to subtract off DC to avoid double counting. So, you know, if there are eight teams in the top division in Sao Paulo in a season, um, this, this count is eight, but for each of, the, each of those teams individually, we have to subtract one off it because we don't want to count you know, we won't, don't want to uh, count the own team in that. So that's the function that, that generates our counts. We have two other standardly used localization measures in the literature. That's called the Ellison uh, Glazer method and the uh, Morel Cedillo measures of raw agglomeration. I'm not going to go into the details about how those are calculated. They're complicated. They're based on shares and Herfindahl indices, but they're, they're just an alternative measure of localization. Again, we don't know what the right measure of localization is here for, uh, for our empirical work. So we're just going to use the approach that we'll, we'll use three different measures and see how the results turn out. So our descriptive statistics, I don't need to spend much time on this, but uh, we've got 1,194 team seasons in the sample. Uh, and of course, again, we can't, we can't use the full sample for the ELO rank, uh, ranking because we have to calculate it for some period before those ELOs stabilize. So we actually have 1,183 of those. Um, yeah, there's the points, there's the wins and losses. So they're pretty evil and they're equal. And there's the goal differential, but I, I don't want to spend much time on the, on, the, um, uh, on the descriptives. And here's our, so our counts and our uh, localization measures, you can just see that we've got pretty good variation uh, in the counts uh, in terms of our localization measures over time. It's, it, it, you know, there's either between zero and four A1 teams in a, uh, in a city uh, in division one, zero to two, zero to two, zero to two. So there, there is localization going on here. There, there are cities that have multiple teams. And of course, Sao Paulo is going to generate uh, a lot of variation in terms of the maximum number. But um, we argue that we've got pretty good variation there and, and variation in our uh, Ellison Glazer and, and uh, MS measures. And then our control variables, the average population is about 1.1 million. Of course, we've got Sao Paulo there. It's really big. Um, and we've got some very small cities that have, you know, teams down in the fourth division. So we have good variation in population. And uh, we've got pretty substantial variation in wages, too. And you can see also there's a lot of uh, 
uh, variation across these other control variables. I'm not even going to talk much about the parameter estimates on these, but employment is is uh, is quite different. So we've got various size cities in our panel. Okay, so um, this here's our uh, our first set of results. Again, this is uh, the the empirical model where the dependent variable is is the short run win loss ratio, uh, and again this is this is our measure. These are localization measures for each of separately for each of the four divisions, uh, median wage, and we're taking population. Uh, this actually should read population density uh, as our measure of urbanization. So we have some evidence that there is uh, there is a, an, a positive effect of localization in that all teams are more successful in general in a city if there are more teams in the fourth division in that city. And here's evidence that that urbanization is important. Cities in higher because a dependent variable here, the win-loss ratio for teams in a city in teams are higher if they're in cities that have larger populations. That would be the usual sports economics result that you'd expect. Now we get these two negative parameter estimates on the, the count of teams in uh, division A1 on team success. And I think that that just reflects the, the zero sum nature of within division competition in these cities. You got more, you got more uh, teams in the top division, they're gonna be better teams. Uh, all the teams on average are gonna be less successful in those, in those, uh, in those cities. Change the dependent variable to goal differential Again, we get these negative effects in the top two divisions. No, no evidence of, uh, of localization in the lower divisions affecting anything, but we get pretty strong um, urbanization results. That is, uh, goal differential is going to be larger and more positive for all teams that play in larger cities, no matter what division they're, they're in. We get some evidence uh, when, we, when we use a dependent variable of points that uh, that agglomerate localization in division four has an effect on firm productivity or team productivity. So those are three short run uh, um, model dependent variables there. We argue there's some evidence of, of uh, localization effects there and certainly evidence of uh, urbanization. So when we, when we have the ELO ranking, this is our long run measure. Again, we get pretty strong uh, evidence, I think, of localization effects the more teams in that municipality uh, in division three, the uh, more successful are teams in that municipality holding other factors constant. And we get a, a population effect as well that, that is uh, in line with the theory. When the dependent variable is the probability that a team gets promoted, again, we get localization of strong localization effects. Uh, across two different measures of uh, localization, both the counts in division four and uh, the um, MS measure of localization in division four, we'd lose our urbanization effect. Again, we get a negative Im impact up here in, in terms of the count of teams in division A1. Uh, I think that's because our, this promotion uh, variable cannot be equal to one in, the, in division A1. You can't get, it's the top division. So we think that's just a feature of the of the um, uh, the way the promotion and relegation ladders work in sports leagues. Again, we get we get uh, localization effects of uh, in relegation. Now these are negative, but remember this dependent variable is equal to one if you get relegated. So these negative and significant parameters mean it's less likely that teams in those sit teams get relegated. Uh, so that's a success measure. They're more successful if they're less likely to be relegated. Uh, and it's from both. We have evidence of it, of when there, there are more localization in A3 and A4. Uh, teams are more successful. I don't know how we get that population effect. So that's basically what I've got. Let, so the example that I will give you, let me go back to my first slide. Uh, Real Madrid plays in the stadium. And I think we all know anybody who follows European soccer, uh, football, sorry, knows that Real Madrid is a, is a very, very successful team. And the standard explanation from the, uh, in sports economics would be Real is 
very successful because Madrid is a very large city. And there's all these urbanization benefits there, which allows Real to, to be successful. Uh, our results say, well, that's not the full story. Real is successful uh, because Madrid is a large city, but Real is also successful because there are a lot of second division La Liga teams in Madrid. And there's a lot of localization of professional football teams in Madrid. And that our results would would suggest that that is contributing to the success of Real because we're getting these per positive parameter estimates on the uh, on the third division and second division localization measures in in the CP. So again, uh, localization of teams in lower in the lower divisions in the CP are important for short term success and long term success of of all teams in the cities in cities. Uh, localization of teams in, in the top division has a negative impact of success. Uh, that's probably just increased local competition there. Uh, what are the implications? We have a generally positive impact of urbanization on success as predicted. So now we know that urbanization effects um, work in developing countries as well as in developed countries like Europe and the United States in terms of firm outcomes. That's, that's interesting uh, results. So the implications here, well, you know, there's no promotion and relegation in sports leagues in the U.S. if you follow that. And that leads the large city teams to often dominate for long periods. And, uh, and many people in the United States have argued that what we need to do in order to make competition better in U.S. sports leagues is put more teams in the largest cities. Yeah, but our, our results say, well, maybe, maybe not. Because if you put more teams in, uh, in large U.S. cities, if you put more, uh, you know, the Patriots win the NFL all the time or very often. So one, one, one person might say, well, if there were two other NFL teams in Boston, the Patriots wouldn't be that good because they'd have to divide up the market. Our results say, eh, maybe not, right? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, our, our results also have implications for, for Europe and, and places like Brazil. Uh, it sheds light on why teams in larger cities continuously enjoy more success than those in isolated and smaller cities. It's not just because of the population, it's because those large cities have, uh, have more teams and more localization and those shared labor markets and uh, knowledge, trans knowledge spillovers are all, um, may also be playing a role. So it's not just large populations that are driving this, uh, you know, why uh, Boca Juniors or River Plot are so successful in, uh, in Buenos Aires, not just because it's a large city, but because there's a lot of football teams in that city and they're enjoying those localization effects. And that's what I have. Thank you, Brad. Uh, I, it's, it, is, uh, it is very interesting. At first I was uh, thinking of uh, possible uh, uh, issues with the history of the cities and the uh, well, long older cities tend to have uh, teams with not older with many more years. And yeah, yeah. That's a thing and reinforcing thing that could affect also part of the result. But the thing that made me, uh, I don't know. Uh, because uh, I don't, in, I don't, I'm not sure how the Brazilian soccer uh, uh, area works. But for example, I see here usually teams can are not able to do what the Patriots do, which is hold the candle for six out of ten years or seven out of ten years. Here it's more in soccer that is more difficult. Although in European soccer you see that. The, the Madrid, uh, Barcelona, yeah. where nobody else gets to be, other teams get to be second or third or fourth. With, uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I we thought about trying to quantify factors like that, um, you know, to try to you know uh, uh, collect data on team on observable team characteristics. 
you know, in our empirical work, Juan, the issue is that's a team fixed effect throughout the model. Those things are, you know, the age of the team is, and our only argument really is those, those things might be, uh, are certainly important. Uh, we're hoping that the team fixed effects are, are at least adequately, you know, controlling for that. But I don't know. You know, that's just a big black box anyway, how those fixed effects work. I, I just hope that, that that's what we've got. No, actually, what I was thinking could be uh, more on the side of uh, uh, cycles. Uh, basically, so you have some years where none of your other indexes fall to fall, to fall but uh, you see low development in the, in the result distribution, which uh, you could probably control using, uh, well, you reduce the, the sample uh, to half, but this uh, average, uh, Mobile, mobile average of results or something like that. In, the, in that sense, uh, the cycles would not be yeah. felt. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And we certainly have plenty of observations that we could do, that, that we could do something like that. Uh, some, the, uh, they sent me a comment related to the money from broadcasting rights and increasing concentration for fewer teams. Uh, basically providing a higher uh, returns for the la la bigger divisions. But, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> but that I mean, could also be division, could be captured by between division and team fixed effects too. But that is... Uh, Absolutely. And that's, that's a good point. Nobody really has, has, has brought that up anywhere we've presented this paper. I will certainly have Amir look into uh, exactly what's going on with how the broadcast rights are, are set in the CP. Uh, and we, we, do, we do need to check and make sure there's not something really systematic going on there that, that yeah. could be an omitted factor that uh, is varying, time varying and, and picking and correlated with our localization effects. Yeah, that's a good point, Juan. Mm -hmm. Was a comment made them um, privately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have any more comments? Uh, we usually open the talk to if anybody wants uh, our guests to receive questions on other subjects. Also, sure, happy to happy <laughs> to take. <laughs> I'm happy to take. Yeah, well, questions. Uh, no, usually, usually, usually it's like. Brad. Oh, you have one. Juan, Juan, Diego Quintero here. Sorry, I would like to ask Brad. Thank you for the for the message. I am usually just because my two boys are professional soccer players. Brad, one plays in Brazil, actually the the oldest one is playing in Brazil. And one of the um, issues that I put some notes here is, um, you say that it's not because the population is higher that the success of the teams are aligned with the model. And I fully agree because maybe mm, the issue that you mentioned there that a lot of teams that are trying to be promoted from a lot of categories, A1, A2, A3 in Sao Paulo, are maybe the source to get more success, not just the population, Brad, in your model. Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. I don't, that, that's, a, that's, that's a good point, that, they're, they, um, that these teams could, could have uh, that goal to get promoted, which, um, it could be could be correlated. Yeah. So is this, is this the idea, Diego? And by the way, thanks very much for that comment. So let me make sure I understand you. The, there are teams that are in large cities that would just have different organizational goals uh, than teams in small cities that would lead them to uh, choose uh, player players that would be more successful. Is that is that is that what you're saying? Exactly. So I don't know how you can correlate that in your model because I like your model, but Mm, because, as I mentioned to you, I know the, the Brazilian league, just because they have the opportunity to catch good players from those smaller teams, maybe one 
issue, one driver to be successful is coming from those smaller teams. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think you're, I think you're right. So, in one issue here is that that um, I'm applying that model to a, a setting where there's a whole ladder of leagues in a promotion relegation system, and I'm kind of waving my hands in uh, in in the sense that it doesn't necessarily it these these uh, team specific organizational goals that you're talking about are not well specified in the model. And, uh, and also they're not, of course, in the, in the empirical work either. And uh, that's, that's certainly a limitation of, uh, of, um, of what we're doing. That's an actually a very good point, Diego. Thank you. I think I, what I need to, we need to have some caveats uh, in the paper to address that and they're not in there now. So I, thanks. Yeah. Your your son who's playing in Brazil is he is he playing in uh, in uh, Sao Paulo or no he's playing in Fortaleza first okay. division a one okay. as you mentioned Brazilian okay. league and he's playing in Fortaleza team there are two teams in Fortaleza Ceará and Fortaleza he's playing in Fortaleza I appreciate your uh, your institutional knowledge and perspective on that, Diego. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Brad, for your knowledge. It was very nice, the, the, the message, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Diego. Uh, I saw a hand. Yeah. yeah, I think it was me, Juan, but I don't know why, why the hand oh, was okay. not... Uh, uh, Brad, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. I have no questions about your work because I'm not an expert of, uh, on this topic, but um, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, in the past, we have had like a couple of master students that uh, they did the master thesis on sport economics, no? and we might have more of those students interested in, uh, interested in this kind of topics in the near future, I believe. Uh, do you know if the informational requirements of this type of work that you have done for Brazil are too demanding so that uh, if they wanted to do it for Colombia, mm, they should maybe not to go on? Or uh, this is something that, I mean, normally, could be like available for any uh, developing country, you know, even if they are not as good as Brazil, I'm um, a little bit less interesting. That's a great question. Yeah. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear uh, that you often have master's students who are interested in sports economics. I'm, I'm not surprised, but uh, I'm happy to hear that because, you know, it's sort of a niche area in economics as all of you know, uh, and, uh, there's actually, you know, there's actually little sports economics research coming out of South America. There's a few people in Brazil, but, uh, and I would really, I, I would encourage uh, students to do that because I think that there's a lot to be learned about outcomes in, in, uh, in sports in, in South America. I, the infra, I mean, most, the, all the outcomes in the leagues that we analyze in, uh, in, in, uh, Sao Paulo, we just scraped all that off the web. Their sports leagues are pretty good if, if about, about putting, all you need is the table at the end of the season and the information that comes off the league table with, at the end of the season. It's really easy to get that if you have any sort of uh, basic web scraping skills. Um, and I would guess that there's probably a Wikipedia page or the, the league in Colombia probably, Juan, does it have a web page that, that has the table at the end of the, or if not, I mean, you can always just go in and the newspapers always have the, the table at the end of the season uh, in these leagues. And uh, that, I think that data that you would need to analyze league outcomes from a sports economics perspective would be easily available. Now, I, don't know about the, I don't know about the availability of salaries uh, publicly, don't know how that works. Um, but also if, um, if students are even interested in European leagues, uh, the any European, you know, La Liga in Spain. If if the students follow that, the data are easily available uh, uh, in those sort of, of uh, 
settings. So yeah, I think the, I think the, the data requirements are quite low for a MA thesis that would focus on, on sports economics. Thank you, Brad. Brad, uh, my comment now would be to tease Amir a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I'm always an interaction kind of guy. And uh, have you thought about giving some uh, special, well, not a special, but league and city weight metrics some work in there? Maybe consider uh, a weight metrics deal with the division and another one deal with leagues to have some teams interact and their effect on their outcome variable the, yeah. or, or their neighboring uh, results. Of course, yeah, it's, yes. I, well, you know, it's, it's a natural question, Juan, for anybody who works in, uh, <laughs> in urban regional <laughs> economics, right? It, yeah. it's, bound, it's bound to come up. Uh, we've, Amir and I have certainly thought about it. Um, I, I think our, our position is that um, that will almost certainly make a difference. What we're trying to do in this paper is just develop some basic uh, evidence about this and uh, to, to go ahead and add a, a spatial econometric uh, approach to this would, I mean, I, I, it, it's important, but we just wanted to find out if there were any localization effects in this setting to begin with. So yeah, it's, it's a great idea at some point uh, we would hope to do that, or somebody really should do that. But you know, for right now, that's we view that as a as a as a next step in another paper. Yeah. Given how little research there is on this topic. Yeah, that is true. That is true, and that could be also uh, on on a follow up in the future too. Also, it's a different question. It's a different question in the approach. Um, is there any more question? To ask the Brad, if anyone has uh, any more comments or wants to send any more comments to Brad, you can send them to me or him. He's, uh, uh, he's very active on Twitter on Humphreys slash Brad. Uh, he yeah. normally replies very well to most of the comments, so uh, you are welcome. If, if you have, uh, you know, if you have master's students who are interested in doing a thesis on sports economics and would like some background or, you know, more information, please feel free to have them contact me. I'd be happy to, uh, uh, you know, provide them whatever sort of um, uh, guidance that I could. Always happy to grow a very small field. Uh, uh, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think we had one. I sent one from you and uh, to search your, your feedback on, not your feedback, you posted some stuff on uh, People missing work due to due to sports games. I sent him to to review some of the stuff she posted on Twitter before. So I we have been doing that, or at least for me, yeah, I've been doing that too. Great, uh, Brad. Thank you very much.